Our next speaker is uh, an example of someone who's taken their idea and made it a reality. But I'll let you tell him about that himself. Uh, as well as developing his social enterprise, The Giving Machine, he's heavily involved in working with its communities. Please give a warm welcome to Richard Morris. So would the world be a better place with more giving in it? How could we give more? Well, last year the UK government published its Giving White Paper. And in that paper they recommended two main areas to focus on. Make it easier to give, make it more compelling to give. But almost all the plans I've seen are based on something I call Giving Version 1. Now, 80% of giving, if you like, donations, are given in response to an ask from someone else, typically for their cause. And in this country, that raises something like £11 billion a year. But rising costs, financial uncertainty, they're real problems for this form of giving. Because at the end of the day, we all have a finite amount of money in our pocket. And if we're continually asked to give more, we might actually feel a bit frustrated because we don't feel we can. And if we're still asked to give more, we might start to feel a bit angry because we can't. And certainly along the lines of what JP was saying, it's like sort of a trading side of things. So where do you go to give more? Is it possible to make it more compelling, easier to give? Well, for the last few years, I've building, been building a social enterprise looking at exactly this issue. And I'd like to share that sort of journey and some of the discoveries with you. Now, I was lucky enough to be in the middle of the dot-com boom in Silicon Valley, California. And I co-founded a startup called North Point Communications. And we were building the first broadband networks out across the States. <coughs> And it was an amazing experience to be part of something from an idea through to a family of eight people, through to actually rolling a network out across 30 states and then floating on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And it left me in a, a very privileged position. But I, my wife and I then came home and we started, uh, started a family. And I carried on in the same kind of work. And pretty soon I found myself commuti commuting into London. In your old slide, you get into a routine, I felt comfortable, got on the train, knew exactly where to stand, get out the right exit, powered up the escalators, got kind of irritated when people were in the way. And I was in that mode for quite a while, and then suddenly something changed. It no longer felt comfortable, it felt unfulfilling. And you know when something's not quite right, you sort of give yourself excuses and you live with it for a while. But eventually I had to be honest with myself. And my wife was very supportive in this time. She asked me the obvious question, what do you actually want to do? I thought, you know, I don't know what, what I want to do. But I do know I don't want to do what I'm doing now. And I want to do something that contributes more. So I stopped. I got a part-time job locally, and then I, I started volunteering with a couple of um, local charities. And the first charity that I, I approached was one called St. Elizabeth's. And I said, you know, what can I do to help? And they said, well, We've got some problems with our seizure monitoring systems. You see, they're a charity that looks after mostly young people in a residential uh, uh, environment and learning environment for uh, people with very severe epilepsy and learning difficulties. And when loud planes flew overhead, it would blank out all the seizure monitoring systems while their residents slept. And when they reset the system, there was a delay in them coming back up. And in that delay, someone could have had a seizure, and that could have been very dangerous. So I helped them uh, sort out their process procedures and negotiate with the local airport authority to keep those loud planes on the flight path that they should have been on. In another uh, organisation I helped uh, was one called IT Can Help. They had a terrible acronym, ITCH. <laughs> and they helped people with uh, mobility and sight issues with their PC problems. And one of the people I met in that role was a young man called El Eraser. Now he lived a few miles down the road from me. And he was just starting a computer science degree with the Open University. Now, Ali Reza was um, completely paralysed from the neck down. And he would control the computer by voice. And with the kind of support of a charity like that, he could actually continue his undergraduate studies. And in fact, he even managed to do some work for me. But he didn't want payment in money. He wanted books that he could download to read. And it was just a great example of how internet technology can make sort of a massive difference to our, in people's lives. 
And certainly I know that uh, this story is not unique, but often when people touch you sort of personally, it really leaves a, a deep impact. And I knew then, I thought, do you know, I, I really want to help more. How can I help more? And I, I was using my time, but I wasn't really using my experience. So I thought, I know. I'll build a little website and um, I can sell products and I can share the margin with those charities. So I put together a little catalogue and I approached those local charities and said, look, you know, if you uh, give that to your supporters, they can buy products, things like barbecues, toasters, MP3 players, that sort of thing, and I'll share the, the margin with you. But they weren't very keen. So, okay. So then I created another um, uh, catalogue. I thought, why don't I go direct to people? And I, I put it through letterboxes locally. And uh, I had it online. And I did sell a number of um, uh, products, mostly sort of friends, family, you know, they sort of clubbing. But I could see it wasn't, wasn't really going to be scale, and, and actually it was a bit rubbish, to be honest. So uh, I was a bit despondent about this, and I spoke to my friend uh, Jonathan Bailey, and I said, you know what, I want to build a company to give money away, but I, I really don't know how to do it. And he said, well, what about affiliate marketing? Now, I don't know if affiliate marketing means anything to you, but it certainly didn't to me at the time. So I had to go and do some research. Now, when you search on, online for a product that you're going to buy, often you'll go to one website, and then you'll click onto a link, and you'll go to another website, and you'll buy from, from that other website. But in many cases, you've just created a, a, a sales commission for someone else you didn't even know. In fact, it turns out that in the UK, over... £300 million pounds a year generated in these sorts of uh, sales commissions. That's £300 million pounds a year that people like you and me are generating, and we don't even see it. It's just sloshing about on the internet. What if we could build a website to capture some of that and divert it to charities and schools of our choice? Well, luckily, uh, Jonathan uh, said that he'd like to join in uh, and build it with me. But we knew we'd need some more help. But Jonathan had uh, quite a lot of, sort of financial experience. <coughs> And I can make a good cup of tea. So we thought, okay. Um, Jonathan knew uh, Mark Clark, who could really help us with um, the marketing and branding side. And I knew Craig McKenzie, uh, uh, who lived locally, and he could create all the sort of website and creative design side of things. So um, we all got together, and they decided they wanted to join in too. Let's see if I can work this thing. So here we are. Four incredibly photogenic fellas. <laughs> And we started meeting on Thursday nights over beer and pizza, a wonderful chemical combination for starting something. <laughs> now, the, the first thing we sort of thought was, well, we've got to get a prototype up and running as quickly as possible. But what kind of business should it be? Well, we were all sort of from a kind of for-profit background, but thinking, well, if our objective is to give away as much money as possible, a sort of traditional for-profit wasn't going to work, because we have investors and they want return on that, and there'd be a conflict of interest. So we said, no, it's going to have to be a not-for-profit. So we set it up as a not-for-profit company. The next thing we thought about is, what, what are we going to call it? And I, I'm far too embarrassed to tell you what our working name is. I might tell you a bit later over the past period, Peter. But um, a, chance a chance comment from Jonathan um, led to us calling it The Giving Machine. So it's probably worth just uh, saying just briefly um, how it works. So if, if you were to join, I need to pick a volunteer here. Um, can I pick you? What's your name? Caroline. Caroline. And Caroline, if you were going to pick a charity or school to support, who would you pick? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, okay. So Caroline would, would join, you can say email address, password, and click on and choose to support Alzheimer's. And at some time uh, later, Caroline said, you know what, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to go and buy some pink fluffy slippers. So she'll come onto the uh, website and she'll find one of the shops, um, well, whatever colour you like really, and uh, come onto the website and you click into one of the shops that's participating and you go and buy your pink fluffy slippers. Now let's say they cost about £20. Well, that might generate £1 in commission. So we would get the £1. So how much of that do we keep to run the organisation and how much do we give away? Well, we did a little bit of research and we found Typically, it's a 50-50 kind of split for a lot of uh, organisations. We thought, well, yeah, we'd like to be a bit better than that. What about a 75-25 split? So that's what we did. Um, we thought that would put a marker in the ground for our intention. And it would be great over time with economies of scale, we can share a higher percentage of that. So in the case of Caroline's pink fluffy slippers, that generates a pound. That would turn into a 75p donation for Alzheimer's um, at no extra cost. 
And in fact, on our system, you can support up to four charities and schools at any percentage split. So we launched our pilot in 2006, and it, it went really well. Local charities, we were connected to them and, and schools. But as soon as we got outside of our local contacts, we hit a problem. What's in it for you? What's the catch? How can it be free? Well, we made giving free, but we'd come up against this barrier of suspicion. What is it that puts that attitude out there? Well, of course, it's our own experience, isn't it? You've won holiday. Someone you don't know wants to put £100,000 in your bank account. Someone you don't know wants to put a million pounds in your bank account. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, how do you overcome suspicion? Well, I guess I, I think the other way of saying that is, how do you actually build trust? We just had to talk to people, listen to them, and learn that actually building trust just takes time. So where are we now? Well, se several years on, and mostly sort of by word of mouth and organic side of things, Forgive Machine is a sort of growing community, and it, it consists of about 400 and some shops. It's about uh, 4,700 schools and charities, and you can see the dots on the map, and um, about uh, 48,000 odd givers who support those schools and charities. But most importantly, over 400,000 free donations have been generated. In fact, I think I checked this morning, it's about 440,000. Now, each one of those donations represents a choice that someone made, and we've been we're hearing about choices um, earlier in the other two talks, a choice that someone made to do something slightly differently, to benefit someone else. Each one of those was a proactive giving decision. It wasn't in response to an ask from someone else. <coughs> but who would give? And why would they give? Well, just before I go on to the next slide, I talked about giving version one. But this is giving version two. If giving version one is about giving your money in direct response to an ask from someone else, giving version two is about giving someone else's money to the causes that you support like Caroline's, Alzheimer's. So who would give? Why would they give? Well, I just want to use um, an example from our uh, network of shops. If you look at, in 2011, uh, how we worked with Amazon, I'm going to try and remember all these numbers, but 14,000 givers actually made about 130,000 transactions that was worth about two million pounds of sales to Amazon. And of course, that generated a corresponding 130,000 donations that then touched 3,000 schools and counties <coughs> up and down the country. The, the amazing thing about this, though, is it's not just about the financial outcome. In a, a study by a social psychologist called Elizabeth Dunn, who looked at how we uh, spend money, more importantly, what kind of spending makes us happy, she gave a certain amount of money to a number of different people. In some cases, they would spend it on themselves, and in other cases, they were to um, give it away. Well, it turns out that those people who gave it away were happier at the end of the day. So, so why is this important? Well, you can argue that for someone like Amazon, we're just another sales channel. We uh, give them business, they give us a sales commission, and what we do uh, with that sales commission <coughs> is, is up to us. But by giving it away to the causes that matter to each of the individuals, it actually has a chance to change their perception of the, the shops. And we did a, a study as well. We asked the, the um, individuals, uh, all our givers, what do they think of the shops that participate in the giving machine? And over 80% of them said that their view of those shops was positively impacted by the experience. Now, where do you go um, in terms of what's the sort of opportunity? <coughs> well, it's amazing. If you look at average online spend, it's about £3,000 um, per year per individual, and that could generate about £150 in free donations. And if you took that offline, that you can multiply that by 10. So each one of us could be generating over £1,000 each per year. And if you multiply that by millions of us, that could be billions. So is this a new business model? Is it a new giving business model? And if it is, what would it take to actually bring it about? Well, of course, it'll take the support of many stakeholders. 
But most importantly, it takes the involvement of people like you, like me, and the people we know, in vast numbers, to take that step, as we heard earlier in other talks, to make, some, uh, make a positive choice, to make a positive difference. And when you add all those up, there's a massive impact. And in our case, we can actually see that with the number of donations. Now, I'd like to um, give everyone here a chance to uh, enjoy giving for free. So, I've been saving up my pound coins, and my children have too. And I'd like you to take um, a pound coin, and I'd like you to give it away to whoever you like. And I'd like you to share that experience on our blog, you can share it on Facebook. And I've got a couple of hands here, excuse the noise. Take one of these, pass it down, there's another couple there, thank you. So, would the world be a better place with more giving in it? How can we give more? I think we've seen we can give more. If we can actually get businesses involved in this too, and we can help give away some of their money, and it would be a better business model for them, it certainly um, would help the causes that we all support, and by, all, by the looks of it, it would actually make us happier too. Thank you very much.